In this chapter, we're going to look at how the effects format is put together. The effects format is a standard way of encapsulating all of the components required to create a shader effect. Both 3ds Max and FX Composer use the effects format, and a lot of other game engines and applications use it as well, so it's a pretty standard format for HLSL shaders. I went ahead and loaded up Chapter 7 Shader.FX and also Chapter 7 Demo.Max from the DVD. So if you haven't done that yet, go ahead and load up the Max file and also the shader. Here at the top of the shader, we have blocks of code that represent data coming into the shader. These chunks build UI elements that let the user define the values. For example, diffuse color here over in Max, if we bring up the material editor, creates this diffuse color slot. Moving on down the shader here, these four lines of code represent matrices that the shader needs to move data from one space to another. We'll talk more specifically about these elements in a minute. In the next part of the shader, we can see the input and output structs that we discussed in Chapter 5. And you'll notice that this input struct is inputting quite a bit more information. This output struct is outputting quite a bit more information. So as we talked about before, the input struct takes data from the CPU and passes it into the vertex shader, and the output struct takes data from the vertex shader and passes it to the pixel shader. Next we have a function. We talked about functions in chapter 6. This function does blend lighting. We'll cover that toward the end of the DVD. Finally, we come to the main body of the shader. This is the vertex shader, and this is the pixel shader. You can also call a pixel shader a fragment program. And just like we talked about in Chapter 6, the vertex shader and the pixel shader are both functions, and we're passing some data into the functions, calculating the results, and then returning the result. And it works the same way with the pixel shader. We pass some information into the function, do some calculations, and finally return the result. And you'll notice that the result the pixel shader is always a color. Alright, let's move down here to the bottom. Here at the bottom of the shader we have techniques, passes, and render states. We'll talk more about this section in a few minutes. So anyway, there's a quick overview of the effects framework. You've got input data at the top. Here we have input struct and the output struct. We've got the vertex and pixel shader. And finally we've got techniques, passes, and render states. Now let's jump in and talk specifically about each component of the framework. First let's talk about the user interface elements at the top of the shader. So we'll move up here to the top. When you write a shader in effects format like this one, in addition to writing the code that defines the appearance of the objects, you also write code that creates a user interface for the artist to use. If we look at our material panel here, we can see that our user interface has ambient color, diffuse color, specular color, glossiness, diffuse texture, and normal map texture, and also a light. Just like with the standard Max material, all of these settings control the appearance of the object. However, unlike the standard Max material, with the effects format, you have total control over what properties show up here. 
All it takes is a few lines of code at the top of your effects shader, and you get whatever user controllable inputs you want. So let's take a look at how it works. This block of code here at the top is the code that defines the ambient color. So if we open up our material panel again, oops, we open up our material panel again, see here we have ambient color and right now it's black. So I've created a float four because it's a color. And I named it ambient color. Then this little label right here out to the side is called an annotation. And what this does is it gives a hint to the program that's using the shader about what this color is going to be used for. Now, when we're talking about UI elements, these annotations are completely optional. So you don't have to put these in at all if you don't want to, and it won't hurt anything. Now we have the opening and closing symbols here. And inside, we have this string that says UI name. What that means is this is the name that's going to be used in the user interface. So we'll, we'll notice right here it's called ambient color. And if I change it, I'm just going to call it Ben's color for fun. Hit save. And you'll see that the max interface updated, and now it's called Ben's color instead of ambient. Well, I need to set that back, so I'll just call it ambient color again. Now finally, we have these four numbers inside curly braces. What these are are the default values for this color. So when you first load up the shader, this is the color that you're going to get. So this kind of this looks sort of like a dark gray color. And you'll notice that these next two chunks here also create colors, the diffuse color and the specular color. Let's say I want to add another color to my shader. The best way to do it is just to copy one of these other chunks. In fact, that's the best way to create all of this user interface code for your shader. Just load up some other shaders that have UI elements that you like and copy and paste them. So let's go ahead and do that now. I'll grab this specular color chunk of code here and copy it. Move down and hit paste. And we'll call this new color. And I'm going to get rid of the annotation because it's optional. And for the UI name, I'm going to call it new color. And for the default value, let's make it 50% gray. OK, so there, I, there we go. We have a new color. And if I hit Save on my shader, Max's interface updates. And I have a new color picker here that I can bring up choose whatever color I want. I have a new color. Now, this new color isn't doing anything yet. It's not changing the appearance of the teapot because I haven't actually written anything in the code down here in the vertex or pixel shaders to use new color yet. But I could go in and just modify this really quick. I'm going to say times new color. Just make sure that I got that right. Oh, looks like we need to capitalize it. I'll come down here to the pixel shader, change it to new color, hit save. Now let's see what happens to our teapot. Well, it turned blue. See that? Our new color is now affecting the teapot. So it's as simple as that. You can add, just edit this out again, set it back the way that it was. So it's as simple as that. You can add any UI elements you want simply by cutting and pasting existing UI elements and uh, adjusting them to, to be the inputs that you need. Before we move on, let me move back up here, and I want to show you some different UI elements. This is glossiness, and glossiness is just a float. So you'll see that it shows up over here in Max as a spinner. And 
we're saying string UI widget equals slider. But Max doesn't have sliders implemented in the effects format interface, and so it's using a spinner instead. Now let me talk about these values right here. UI min is the smallest possible value that you can have. So if I come over here to max and drag this spinner down, notice that it doesn't go any lower than 1. And that's what UI min means. And UI max is the same, only it's the highest possible value. So if I drag this spinner up here, it only goes to 128. That's the limit. This UI step, that's how many how far does it go each time I click. So if I click down, it's going to step by an increment of 1. And then UI step power is how fast the spinner accelerates as I pull it. But I don't think that works in Max. And then finally we have the name, which is glossiness, and that shows up here. So there are a lot of additional settings that you can use when you're putting in just a, a float value. And finally, let's talk about this texture input here. So instead of float or float4, I'm saying texture, and I give my texture a name, and then I also have an annotation for that. Then string name is the default texture that's going to be used when this when there's when you first load up the shader and then just like before UI name gives the name for this texture slot and then we say string texture type equals 2d so that we know it's a 2d texture instead of a cube map so there we go those are the UI elements and you can see that it's really easy to just add whatever inputs you need for your shader and they show up as UI elements in Max.